Hello everyone here. I'm Neeta Radhakrishnan, your host for Global Hemong Chat from Onco Daily. And I welcome you all to today's session. Today we have a very special guest, Neil Ranasinghe. Neil does not need any introduction for those of you who have been active in pediatric cancer research. He is the parent of a childhood cancer survivor. And uh, after going through that ordeal, he has used his experience for the benefit of millions of others around the globe. He's been involved in a lot of cancer charities, a lot of cancer education programs, and he has contributed his expertise as, um, as a, um, a, parent, uh, as a parent of a survivor to many, many educational activities across the globe. He's the co-founder of a group of parent, uh, uh, parents called PORT that reviews documents for parents and patients when asked to join a pediatric oncology clinical trial. He has actively contributed to SIOP Global Health Education and Training Working Group, as well as to Point, a website that had educational content for healthcare professionals from low and middle income economies. And outside all these voluntary activities, he works at the London Stock Exchange. So welcome, Neil, to today's session. And we're very, very happy that you could join us today. Great. So thank I'll you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Hi, Neil. So why I would start with asking you as to what drives you to do what all these uh, things that you do, uh, all these voluntary activities that you do, what drives you to do all of this? That's a good question. Um, as you say, my, my daughter had leukemia when she was she was very small. She graduated from university just last year. So, so our journey with her has, has gone very well. We're, we're very fortunate in where she is now and with hardly any late effects. So and I appreciate that the situation for me and my family in London is very, very different from a lot of families across the world when their child has cancer. So I'm just trying to help and advocate for children with cancer in countries that don't have universal health care or they don't have good health care or the situation isn't as good. So I'm just trying to do my little bit to help other families in a similar situation. Yes, wonderful. So what are the activities that you're currently focusing on? Um, in the UK, I'm still active uh, in this group called PORT. We still, whenever there's a clinic, a paediatric oncology clinical trial, we get to review the patient information sheets before they're approved by the government for use. There's also um, an annual conference called the London Global Cancer Week. So I'm active involved in that. And within SIOP, I'm active in the SIOP Global Mapping Program, which I was one of the core members in 2018. And that, that's very exciting now because the data is actually being used and requested across Latin America, and we're collecting data across Asia as well. So this is a very exciting project to be part of. Yeah, I think, and that's the one data which will actually give us a lot of uh, information on what are the gaps in services which are available across the different regions of the world. So um, I, I recently saw your a small article written by you on abandonment. So, and I thought I was pleasantly surprised to see someone from UK write about it because um, abandonment is something that we face in uh, in countries like India, as well as in other uh, countries, low and middle income countries. This is something which we struggle with on a day-to-day -day basis. So uh, what has been your experience with abandonment when you find parents uh, abandoning treatment in different regions and you worked across the globe in certain projects? So what is in what according to you is abandonment and why do people abandon treatment? That's that's a really good question. I think in the UK we're lucky to have the National Health Service. So all the costs are paid for and the standard of healthcare is good. And actually, if a parent can't take their child for treatment, then the government will intervene. And so that there's no abandonment isn't a problem in the UK. But treat, as you say, treatment abandonment is a massive problem across the world. So this is where a child is diagnosed with cancer and either the child doesn't start the treatment for cancer or the child doesn't finish the treatment for cancer. 
And in most cases, this has a t terrible consequences and this usually will mean the child dies. So, and we know that this, this is very, very high. This is a very, very big problem. And in some parts of the world, some places it's even as high as 40%. So 40% of the children that are diagnosed, they get cancer. And for whatever reason, they, they don't finish treatment. So there's lots of groups and people around the world trying to improve this problem. And I know your hospital works very hard on this. So just trying to help and educate and help professionals and help families understand what's going on. So um, across the regions, like I think financial reasons, uh, financial toxicity of treatment is one of the reasons that parents uh, do abandon treatment. But other than that, what are the other reasons um, uh, that you have faced? Is it um, uh, fear about the uh, fear of cancer or fear of chemotherapy? What are the other reasons for which parents uh, uh, stop treatment? I, I think... There's, as you say, there's lots, there's lots of different reasons, and those different reasons vary across the world. But I think one of the one of the perhaps one of the big reasons is parents feel as though cancer's a death sentence. So when the child gets cancer, the child's going to die, and if they take the child to hospital or they give them chemotherapy, it's not really going to make any difference in one, two, three years, the child's going to die. And also we can see for some families, it's very difficult. They've got a, a fairly healthy child. They've been diagnosed with cancer, but not, not really, really sick. And then they start treatment and they lose their hair. And because of the chemotherapy, they suddenly deteriorate, not suddenly, but they'll deteriorate. And then again, the parents are thinking, well, my child was sort of okay a little while ago and now I'm bringing them to this hospital and the situation is getting worse so I think this this education that can for most types of childhood cancers it is curable this we just need to sort of spread that message but there, but there are lots of different reasons and I just say that the word abandonment is discussed heavily in the paediatric oncology community because it sounds very accusatory sort of like as though the, the parent has decided to abandon treatment mm -hmm. and that that isn't the case at all abandonment really mean only means the treatment has stopped we're not placing any blame on the parents we're not placing any blame on anyone it's just often for financial reasons yeah. and we hear stories of it could take it could take the it could take six, eight, twelve hours of travel for the parents to take the child to the hospital for the for an outpatient clinic. And the parents have to take time off work, which they might not be permitted. The parents might not have the money for public transport. The parents might not have the money for the care. The parents might not have the money for accommodation if they can get the child to the outpatient clinic. And for my the disease my daughter had was leukemia and for my daughter it's different for girls and boys my daughter had treatment for over two years and for boys the treatment is for over three years and leukemia as you know leukemia is the most common type of childhood cancer so this means that that's a lot of outpatient visits that's literally years of outpatient visits and if the patient, if the families are really struggling economically, then it is it's a big it's a big problem. We have to try and help the families. True. So for many families, especially the families that we see from uh, poor socioeconomic strata, it's a daily wage uh, that is lost. So they are not mm -hmm. a salary job. So they when they come to the hospital, if and if it's two weekly one visit, though we often hear requests for changing the outpatient day to a Saturday uh, just because they don't want to lose wages. So because some of them can uh, afford it. They're working in offices, they can still do it. But for daily wage, earner, uh, daily wage earners, they're actually losing wages uh, for that particular day. And it is really sad. So it's uh, when we have analyzed, it's not... Uh, it only it's not only financial toxicity there's a whole lot of uh, um, myths surrounding like you said 
anxiety surrounding cancer or the child when initially deteriorates, they lose hope and they run away. Children uh, who lose hair are so emotionally traumatized, they don't want to continue treatment. So there are so many aspects when, you know, it takes a whole village to kind of sit together with the family mm. and, and hold them through this uh, process. So one of the uh, things that has helped us in this journey is to get uh, survivor parents to speak to the current parents. So I'm sure you will be meeting so many of parents, so many parents uh, on a regular basis. So what is the advice that you give to parents? I'm sure in UK, since uh, uh, even in UK, there will be so many anxieties surrounding a diagnosis of cancer, right? So what do you tell parents uh, when they speak to you? Parents of children who are actively undergoing treatment for cancer. The the thing the thing I say, which which might not sound very helpful but we found at, at the beginning and this isn't really related to abandonment but this is related to treatment in general so as i say we my daughter was diagnosed with leukemia and we were told she would be on treatment for about two and a quarter years and at the beginning of treatment the treatment is the hardest there's more there's longer stays in hospital there's considerably more chemotherapy and there's a big adjustment the family are going through. So to be told you've, we've got two and a quarter years of that, it's very, very difficult. It's really overwhelming. So the, the thing I say to families, well, I'd say three things, is one is try and do it on almost a day-to-day -day basis. Try not to think I've got two and a quarter year more years. I've got 18 more months of this. It, it's really overwhelming and it's very difficult to imagine the end and you can't see the end so it's a cliche but it's almost try and take each day as it comes so we're going to get through this day we're going to get through this week we're going to get through this month and then you can slowly get towards the end and the the other thing i would say it it, it, it really varies and i know some families have it very very difficult is that we we try to live a fairly normal life, mm. and and went and still carried going to playgroup when she wasn't very well, and she started school when she was when she was well enough, and she was lucky enough to learn how to swim, while she was on treatment. Now I I know that can sound very, almost offensive, to some families because I know it's very very difficult for them and they're just in hospital and they've got a very very sick child mm -hmm. so i appreciate that so i'm not for those families you have my sympathy and i'm not saying go out and be active but yeah. for us what what worked for us was trying to but trying to act as though things were normal and definitely not thinking about we've got two and a quarter years more of this mm -hmm. treatment just breaking it down by day or by week yeah. It must be very, very tough. And what do you do? You advise parents also? Like parents, um, I feel at times are so emotionally uh, distraught in this whole process. And the time that we get to spend time with the parent is just few minutes in our outpatient clinics or in the ward. So, as a parent, how would you advise other parents? How should they go through this for their own uh, emotional uh, health? Yeah, that that's. I could I could speak to you for hours uh, for hours about this. I think it's just trying to get support from people where you can get support, mm. but sometimes that's not possible, or your family might be a long way away. But I think without without getting too deep, I think it's just real just acknowledging those emotions. So, if a parent is really struggling or finding it really hard, then I think you just have to. So really sort of appreciate that. But I am finding this very hard. I am really struggling. And it's okay to feel like that. It's not a case of, oh, just get on with it. There's other families that are in a worse situation or my son or daughter is really ill. They need me to be strong. I think you, they do need to, you to be strong, but it's okay to really appreciate and recognise that it, it is very tough for parents as well. And it, it plays emotionally. It's very, very difficult. So there's, I haven't really got much advice there apart from don't sort of hide from those feelings or sharing this. I'm almost feeling bad asking you the question 
because you know um, it brings back probably uh, uh, you know that struggle that you would have gone through but thank you so much for answering that because i i often feel uh, that uh, parents are never being discussed in the whole process it's just the child child's emotional security child's physical uh, health that is being always discussed um, so parents also should have a self help group or some mm. support uh, supportive care network should be around them as well thank you so much and one final question uh, there's so much information out there on social media nowadays patients walk in with a diagnosis with information at their in their phones as to what all treatment is going to be given so and there's so much of false information also out on social media so as a new parent who has a as an apparent who has a child with a newly diagnosed uh, malignancy how what would you advise uh, the parents out there as to where should they look for information how would you know whether it's uh, fake information or not yeah this is this is a very difficult one this is we see and you probably see stuff that says Western medicine or chemotherapy is bad, so avoid it. And if you, if you try this, if you try this diet, then you can cure cancer. And we we see that we see that regularly, and it has terrible consequences. So my advice and our advice is go, is get information from the really big organisations. So mm -hmm. I know there's national organisations in. India, and I know you're part of some of these national groups. And there's there's national organisations ac across the whole the whole world. And I, I would go to those ones. Or if you can find a really really big national charity, then get the information from there as well. But yeah, just Twitter or other places or just opinions. Then yeah, try try and avoid that. It's it's. It's wrong. It, I wouldn't say it's wrong. It's going to be wrong all the time, but it's it is a high likelihood it will be wrong, and also it can be very scary as well. So it can be really very harmful. But that but that's that's a good question because I think as adults, a lot of a lot of the, a lot of times when we're not very well, I think the first thing we do is we go to the internet and have a look and see what's see what the problem is but i think when it's when it's our children with cancer and we do have we do have detail we we have worked out how to treat children with cancer we have good methodology and there's been lots of research so the doctors know what they're doing so trust the doctors and get the information from either a national society or a really really reputable well-known national charity thank you very much neil so um so we heard from neil that um, neil is a parent of a childhood cancer survivor and he's explained his uh, journey to us he's uh, told us how to stick on with treatment and not to stop treatment in between and however difficult it may be just take one day at a time and um, just get your information right speak to self help groups speak to others who are going undergoing treatment and speak to your treating team which would help you get through the treatment as best as possible thank you neil for joining us today and from all the listeners of onco daily and i would uh, like to thank you for uh, for spending time with us from a busy day at work we could see movement behind you and uh, we look forward to chatting with you again on another topic that's close to your heart thank you fabulous great yes. thank you very much it's been an absolute pleasure Thank you.